All right. Well, welcome to our call this morning with Department of Labor Commissioner Mark Butler, a uh, board member of the Georgia Chamber too. We're excited to have him with us today on our, I guess we end up doing two of these calls a week. So uh, Commissioner, thank you for being with us. Uh, before uh, I turn it over to the Commissioner from an update from the Department of Labor, let me give you a kind of a, a quick update from our end. Hopefully you're following the Georgia Chamber on our COVID-19 landing page. We're putting up uh, new information literally daily, if not hourly, that we're getting from the federal level, as well as from our partners. I know we asked for questions for the commissioner today, and we've got a lot here that we'll go through with him, but a lot of the questions were around the new P3 legislation coming out of the phase three Senate House bill out of the U.S. Congress. Now, I did a call last night with the White House, and a couple of updates uh, that I'll share with you. So. Um, we can then kind of turn our attention to Department of Labor. If you are a business, a small business in Georgia or a nonprofit, uh, you'll be able to have access to those funds, uh, those that payroll protection plan starting tomorrow on April 3rd. Now we've heard from some of you that your banks are telling you they don't have the rules and regs yet. Um, they should have those today. Uh, they should be up and running tomorrow. If not, I'd encourage you to reach out to another bank. Some banks won't participate in this program, but our indication is many, many in Georgia will. If you are a sole proprietor, an independent contractor, or if you're self-employed, uh, you'll be able to apply for that payroll protection loan on April 10th. So they're trying to get this first group through where the rules and regs are done, and then they're making the rules and regs for the other ones, and they'll be ready to go on April 10th. Now, we have had a lot of calls about what's included and what you can use that loan for. Uh, you can use it for eight weeks worth of mortgage, rent, uh, utilities, as well as obviously your payroll. Uh, it will be retroactive going back to February 15th. It will be effective through June 30th. One of the questions we had earlier this week with Senator Perdue and with um, Ashley Bell was what happened to some of the employers out there that had previously fired an employer, let them go because of the COVID-19 outbreak. Could they rehire those individuals? And I did ask that call last, I asked that question last night. And you may, according to the White House, as of 6.15 last night, you may rehire those employees if they were let go after February 15th and still get credit. So you can bring them back on to your payroll. Uh, those loans will be at a, will be no more than a 4% interest rate uh, and up to $10 million. And so again, we encourage you uh, for those loans to work with your local banks. Of course, the disaster relief loans that are already available to you are being updated with SBA, uh, SBA partners. Encourage you to reach out. We already know many of you have already really applied for those, the, the $10,000 uh, grant and you've already received those dollars and so those are moving through the system they're moving through quickly and many of you have already gotten the, the loans uh, the disaster loans the other thing I'll mention before we, we go to the commissioner is if you've already gotten a disaster relief loan from SBA you can roll that loan into a new payroll protection loan with your local bank so those two will connect you can roll them all together so you just have one payment you'll just need to have that discussion with your banker Again, this is changing rapidly, and as soon as we get information, we're posting it on social media and on COVID-19 uh, webpage, and encourage you to follow along. Now, today we have with us, as I mentioned, our, our good friend, Commissioner Mark Butler. Uh, the Department of Labor is playing such an incredible role, has been such a great partner through this effort, and I know, Mark, you guys have just been overloaded with unemployment claims and questions from partners, and so we do appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. and and just bless you and all the hard work that your team is doing. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our commissioner and let him give us an update um, of where we are with the Department of Labor. Mark. Okay, well, thanks for having me on. And first of all, I'll start off by apologizing to those of you who've been having some issues getting through to us. Uh, and I'll explain to you, and this is not an excuse, I'm just telling you what's going on. Uh, due to the fact that, you know, there's a lot of confusion out there, especially due to the fact that a lot of individuals have never had to uh, apply for unemployment before. Uh, and even though I think we've put some pretty good instructions up there, uh, we've been getting a lot of phone calls. When I say a lot of phone calls, uh, I think uh, when we took a look at a system at one point this week, uh, we had approximately about 80,000 phone calls happen in one work day with uh, approximately about three to 400 available lines. 
And so that tends to kind of um, jam things up. And hopefully some of the things that we've been doing this week are going to cut down on some of those phone calls. Uh, our IT department, I want to give a big shout out to because this is where we're going to win this battle. Uh, they have made a lot of changes, uh, daily changes uh, to our systems. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and put this. This has not been put out to the news or anything, but um, we had a breakthrough last night uh, and we were able to actually process over 100,000 claims just last night. Uh, so I think uh, I, when you take a look at what we did last week plus uh, just last night, we've been able to probably process over a quarter of a million claims in less than two weeks. And when you consider the fact that we're normally under our current staffing levels right now, uh, we're used to doing about no more than 5,000 claims a week. That's kind of an astonishing number and an achievement to be able to pull off. Now, that being said, let's talk about some of the things that uh, we've been able or that we've been trying to do uh, in order to uh, help this process go faster. One of the things was uh, early on, we saw that we were going to see a heavy load of claims. And one of the ways that we could uh, make that easier, not only on uh, the claimants or the ones getting uh, the unemployment, but also on my employees, uh, was to put an emergency rule that uh, made every employer who's going to be doing layoffs uh, file what we call internally and externally uh, partial claims process. Now, first of all, let me give you a definition of what partial claims means. Partial claims does not mean you only get part of an unemployment check. What it means is uh, they're actually still your employee, but they are not receiving pay during that week. So they are partially, I guess maybe we should change it to partially employed uh, instead of partial unemployment. Uh, and so that's a process actually that's been around since 1965. However, most states have actually gotten rid of this process and no longer offer it. Uh, and so in those states, Every claim that's going to be filed is going to be done individually. And now the reason why we did this is because uh, our system can allow you to upload all your employees and all the information for them. And the process for them getting their unemployment uh, is much, much faster. Before all this happened, uh, when you went through all the different hoops that you were having to go through, it could take as much as uh, three weeks in order for somebody's claim to get through the entire process. And that is including they're coming in, applying for it, and you having the, the chance to, to answer to it. Uh, when you do a partial claim, uh, we can process that claim and have it approved in 48 hours. Uh, so it's one of those things very necessary to, to get the unemployment to your employees as quickly as possible. But also it takes a lot of stress off of our system. Uh, because uh, we get that in one batch and instead of, uh, you know, let's say if you have 200 employees or even 1,000 employees, instead of having 1,000 individual claims, we get that one submission uh, that we can process all together that already has all the information on it. And that's why we did it. Uh, if we did not do that, it would have been a, a much bigger problem. Uh, and also, it puts you, the employer, in control uh, of the unemployment process because you'll be the ones that's going to be recertifying and putting in if you bring any of them back for part time you'll be putting in uh, their pay, how much they're getting paid uh, also you'll be the one that decides when it's time hopefully when this is over uh, to recall all those individuals and when that happens then you will no longer be certified for them uh, and uh, that hopefully it will come back uh, and uh, uh, go right back to work. Uh, it's, a, it's going to be a feature that I don't think anybody has, has, has quite appreciated yet that you're not going to be seeing in other states. Uh, if you lift it all up to individual claims, uh, then that individual would be the one certifying every single week, and they could probably play it out a little bit longer. Uh, in this case, uh, that's going to be in the control of the, um, uh, the employer. Uh, you'll be the one that decides when it's time to recall, uh, and then at that point, you will quit certifying uh, that uh, they are still unemployed and still need their unemployment check. Now, there's a lot of other features that are going on right now. Uh, you know, if you'll, it, it, one of the big things that we see right now has to do with the CARES Act that was signed uh, into law last Friday. Like a lot of other things coming out of uh, Congress and out of Washington, we are still awaiting uh, guidance about how they want us to administer uh, that program. And so we are waiting on that, uh, which is common practice uh, when we are administering a program on their behalf to wait on their guidance because we need to figure out how they want us to administer who they want us to administer to and how we're going to get reimbursed uh, for those monies because it's going to you're talking about a lot of money we're talking about six hundred dollars per employee and there's going to be two different systems also you're going to have individuals who are currently on regular unemployment they'll be getting the six hundred dollars 
uh, a week and to go along with what they're getting from the state. But then also one of the features that they threw into uh, the legislation has to deal with independent contractors, or let's just you know, put it down to this. It's gonna be for individuals uh, that are not currently in the unemployment system, that there's no taxes being paid on, uh, they're not in our system, we have no data on them. They're actually also gonna be eligible for a $600 a week benefit. Uh, this is the part that's gonna be the most difficult for us to, uh, to administer and the thing that we're really needing guidance and help from the US Department of Labor on. Uh, because our system is not set up to make payments to individuals who are not currently paying into the system. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, this is going to take a, a quite a bit of programming on our part, and we do do our own programming internally, which has actually been a godsend for us in this. Uh, if we had to call up a, a vendor every single time we had to make a change uh, when this stuff has come up, then uh, we would probably still be about two weeks behind where we currently are right now. Uh, so we're able to be uh, 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 to move a lot quicker on things. So that that part we're still waiting on. Uh, we do have a call with USCO Well, I think around one or one thirty this afternoon, uh, and hopefully they're going to be telling us uh, about the guidance that's going to be coming out and will be coming out. Uh, so we're hoping to hear from them this afternoon. If they don't give us guidance today, you will hear something else, and that'll be me probably putting out a very nasty uh, press release demanding that they do so. Uh, because uh, Georgians are getting impatient, businesses are getting impatient, and I'm getting impatient. Um, because, uh, you know, they were very uh, insistent that we hurry up and sign the agreements for all these additional uh, features in the CARES Act, and, and quite frankly demanded that we have all of our agreements in place and signed by midnight last Saturday, which we did. And so we've done our part, and so we need them to do their part and let us know how they want us to administer this program. Um, so, you know, with the partial claims process that we've asked uh, all of our businesses uh, to uh, be a part of, it should make it much easier on their employees. Uh, the individual ones, uh, we're trying to find uh, ways to uh, cut some corners and be able to get those claims processed faster, which I think we made a lot of headway in last night uh, doing that large batch approval process and by doing 100,000 claims. Uh, and to give you an idea what that means to us, when you're having to do these claims manually right now, uh, we are only able to physically do about 2,400 uh, claims a day by hand and by able to automate that process, which again, our IT department deserves, deserves all the credit, by able to do uh, automate that process and do 100,000 last night, uh, that's, that's huge. Uh, and it's really gonna help a lot of people. And the next steps are gonna be able to uh, administer this new part in the CARES Act. I think that's kind of the, the big issues. I think a lot of people have already kind of caught up on some of the things that we're doing. So I, I'm ready for your questions. All right, Commissioner, thank you. Uh, and listen, these questions are a little bit all over the place. We've got tons of them from our, our members. Um, yeah, I've got them here too. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't fall in your perspective, just tell us and we'll help our members later. But um, I think you've answered quite a few of them already. But we also know that, that some some of the essential employer sectors are hiring right now and I right. so appreciative of those folks. How can that employer check with the Department of Labor to make sure that they're not hiring someone that's also drawing unemployment insurance from their former employer? Well, there's several things. First of all, um, I'm going to try to narrow this down so because I know we have limited time, but there's several ways this can happen. First of all, uh, if you're doing your new hire reporting as required, uh, that, you know, gets uploaded to the Department of Human Resources. And then um, uh, we actually get that information from them on a daily basis and we can cross check that. And so we're going to catch that if you're doing your new hires reporting. Uh, also, it is actually up to that individual, if they're receiving unemployment benefits, to either let us know uh, what they made on gross wages or if they, uh, if they're a previous employer actually filed on their behalf, they're supposed to be letting them know uh, if they received any additional wages. Just like if you, uh, if you as a business, uh, if you were to do the partial claim process and lay off your uh, employees, but you need to bring some back, you also have to report how much you're paying them. And it's very important because uh, one thing that I didn't talk about earlier, uh, we also added in another feature uh, to help Georgians, and that is it has to do with the amount of uh, money somebody can make per week or it affects your unemployment benefits. Uh, under the old rules, an individual could only make up to $50 a week before there was a dollar for dollar subtraction above the $50 from their unemployment benefit. We've increased that amount to $300. Uh, 
So in effect, uh, if you want to kind of do the really quick math, and I'm going to oversimplify this, let's say you have an employee that was able to get the maximum amount of unemployment benefits uh, from uh, the state of Georgia, which is $365. You can affect pay that employee up to, when you, if you brought them back part-time, up to $300 a week. And then they would also be able to get the full amount of unemployment from us. And then when the CARES Act takes effect, they would get an additional uh, $600. So you're talking over $1,200 a week they could be making under this cert provision. Now, if you happen to pay them more than $300, once you get over $300, it subtracts dollar from dollar from their state benefit. Now, if you pay them so much that it exceeds the $300 plus whatever um, uh, they're getting from us, then not only do they, will they not receive any unemployment from us, but they also will not receive um, uh, any money from the CARES Act, the $600. So let's say they're getting the maximum. The most they could actually make would be uh, during a week from you as an employer would be six hundred and sixty four dollars because they have to get at least one dollar from us in order to get the six hundred from the feds i know it seems kind of confusing but you're taking a three hundred dollars that they can make allowable by us and then you pay them you know uh, if you're paying them six hundred dollars and you have to subtract the three hundred out and so the total can be no more than what's allowed by us at three hundred and then whatever they're their benefit is, okay? And they have to get at least $1 from us. Uh, if we need to explain that a little bit more, if somebody has some confusion, uh, I know it does seem a little bit confusion, but basically they can make $300 uh, from, uh, and, and, and get 100% of their benefit. Anything above $300, it's a dollar for dollar subtraction, and they have to get at least $1 of state unemployment benefits to qualify for the $600 from the CARES Act. And I know that, I mean, I mean that, that's, a, that's a lot of math and, uh, and it almost seems like one of those word problems you got when you were in sixth grade, but uh, that, that's how it, that, that's how it kind of works. But you really, you know, you can really benefit some people, especially your lower age, I'm assuming your lower wage workers. If a matter of fact, I talked to a business yesterday and explained it to them uh, and it was a moving company. And because uh, he was worried about employees walking off the job because right now you can use almost any excuse uh, right now and get unemployment. And I showed them how they could make a lot more money if they would come back part time so he wouldn't lose his employees. And I think he was able to retain about 90 to 95 percent of his employees after he explained to him what he was going to do. OK. Um, all right. I'm going to move through these uh, in light of everybody's time here. I don't really understand this question, but hopefully you will. Are group homes licensed by the healthcare facilities regulation regulatory group? considered to be healthcare providers and thereby are they exempt from the paid sick leave option? I don't know if that question makes sense to you. Okay, well that doesn't, I mean, no, we, we don't make that determination, uh, but uh, we are hearing, or I've seen some stuff uh, on some of the things that USDL puts out uh, where that there may be at some point where uh, that may can be designated by US Department of Labor in their own rulemaking where they could actually include those in there. Uh, and so if we need to help the association to see if, uh, make sure that gets included uh, to be exempted. But right now uh, it's very unclear whether or not they're gonna actually allow that. But I think that they can through rulemaking process include those. Now, like I said, that's uh, beyond our scope. Uh, we don't have the regulatory authority to do that ourselves. Uh, it's not in our regs. Um, so, uh, it seems like they ought to be able to make that, uh, connection, but, um, like I said, that's not under ours. Okay. Uh, if an employee does not meet the, the Georgia Department of Labor standard wage requirements, in other words, if they're a new resident, should they file for UI benefits in their previous state of residence or work with your office? Well, they actually can do both. I mean, obviously, if they're a brand new hire, you're, the process is probably going to be a whole lot easier, a whole lot quicker if they would apply in the previous state. And the reason being, uh, right now, I mean, we're right here uh, at the end of the first quarter, and we don't have uh, the wage reports yet, so we don't really know what has been reported right now. Uh, so, uh, but now they can apply with Georgia, and we will work with the interstate claim system, which unfortunately right now is being overloaded uh, and is having some very difficult uh, times, and we don't. Uh, we, we don't manage that. That's managed uh, by somebody else. Uh, and we'll work with them. Now, it will take them longer uh, because we will have to go, go get that information from the other state. 
Um, so in some cases, uh, depending on how long they work for you, it may be better for them to claim with the other state. Uh, but they can claim through us. Uh, and we'll just have to go and, uh, and go get their other wage data at, at, a, at a later date. Okay. Um, I've had this question asked a couple different ways. Let's see if this one makes it clear. Does, does, does Georgia plan to waive the typical seven day waiting period for benefits uh, and the requirements uh, at the, or, and the requirement that they actively search for work while they're receiving the benefits? Yeah, all this has already been put in the emergency rule. First of all, uh, there's, uh, unlike a lot of states, Georgia actually does not and never has had a waiting week. Uh, so we, uh, that, that, that's already been taken care of. The good news for Georgia and our trust fund is, is one of the incentives that Congress put in uh, the CARES Act was if you do away with your one week waiting period, uh, they, they will pay for the first week of benefits for all Georgians out of the, you know, for, for, all, for, for all citizens across the United States. So we've already done that. So we're going to get that money refunded back to us. So that was already good. That, we've already checked that box. Um, and with your second question, the second part of your question was, uh, oh, the work search. Yes. Uh, yeah, we've already waived that. Uh, along with any in-person, now I know that some people have been getting messages saying report to your career center. Uh, a lot of those automated messages are just that, automated messages. And uh, quite frankly, we have not had time to work with a vendor that does that to get that changed. Uh, that is based on previous uh, practice before the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, but I mean, uh, the stuff on our website that's under the COVID-19 banners, that takes precedent over anything else that you're getting. If it says that you do not report to career centers, do not do work search, then that's what applies. And that's, you know, right now we've, we've, we have suspended all of that. Uh, so they don't have to do work search and you absolutely are not to be reporting in person to a career center. Uh, we had to cut off access to our career centers early on uh, two weeks ago uh, because we were already starting to get reports in that people were showing up possibly sick. And that puts uh, the public in danger because in, in those waiting rooms are somewhat small. Uh, so we don't want to have them all bunched in there and possibly spreading it around. But also, if our employees end up getting sick, that takes away capacity from us uh, from able to do the work of actually processing claims. And right now, I need every single person that we have uh, that we can you know that, we, that can show up or either work from their home uh, doing this type of work. Please remember that during the recession, uh, we had over 2,200 employees. Uh, being able to do all the work that we're doing right now, except today we have barely over a thousand total employees. Uh, typically what you would see uh, during a recession is you would have time in order to staff up. Uh, but we didn't get that time. You know, we've had 14 days to figure this out. And so it's uh, made it uh, uh, very difficult uh, on the staff and, you know, and we're taking care of them the best that we can. Uh, but they're, I, I can't say enough about my staff and how hard they're working right now. And, we, and we, we appreciate them more than we can tell you. Uh, a few more questions here in, in live. We have about seven minutes here left. Um, we have some nonprofit questions out there that they are yes. self-insured for unemployment insurance. How, does, how do they handle, how do, are you going to handle that with the self-insured part? Well, I'm going to go ahead and kill another question for you too in the same one uh, because it, it will apply to both. Uh, another thing that we did uh, starting two weeks ago is we have frozen every single business's uh, account as far as what you're currently paying unemployment taxes. None of the unemployment uh, payments that are going out right now will be charged to your account. So you're going to be held harmless. What that means to you is your unemployment taxes are not going to be affected by the COVID-19. Now, because we're doing it for businesses, we're also doing that uh, for our nonprofits. Now, if you're a nonprofit, uh, now, some nonprofits actually do pay into the system and do pay unemployment taxes. They will be just like any other business. And then you have other nonprofits which actually do report wages to us. However, they are, as you would say, self-insured, which means in a typical uh, situation, if they laid individuals off, uh, we would pay the unemployment. And then uh, later on, we would send them a bill for the amounts of money that we paid out. Uh, we are going to waive that for them. And so they uh, actually will not have to pay us back for the benefits. Now. There's going to be another uh, set of nonprofits. These are the ones who are not reporting to us right now, who are not paying taxes. Uh, those are going to be a part of the CARES Act when we get guidance from it. Their employees will also be able to get unemployment as soon as we find out from the USDOL how they want us to manage that and what kind of information they want us to gather from 
uh, these individuals and these organizations. And so we should be able to cover uh, all three aspects uh, with at least amount of, uh, you know, uh, impact on their operations as, as we possibly can. So we've uh, gone above and beyond to make sure that we're waiving all this and that Georgia's businesses and nonprofits are going to be as uh, slightly impacted as possible. So when you say you're, you're freezing them where you are, so the next question I had was if, if the employer is paying the unemployment insurance and the employee just decides that they're not coming to work right now, do they still have to pay that unemployment insurance? That employee, if they just walk off the job and let's say that they, they come, that they go online and part of their application is I have several kids that I have no way to, to get daycare for them, et cetera. I mean, that's, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why they can get unemployment right now and they can't be denied. All right, so it's kind of a losing battle if they do walk off. Um, but especially the stuff that was added in on the federal level. I mean, there's almost any many number of excuses. So that person can come in and they can apply for unemployment and no, it will not count against you you as a business. We will not be charging your account. I mean, uh, like I said, we want to make sure that uh, at the end of this, uh, one of the burdens you're not going to have to deal with is increased unemployment taxes. However, mm -hmm. What everybody needs to understand is our trust fund is going to take a massive hit. Uh, so at the end of the year, we may have to revisit some of the surcharges and things like that because we are socializing the cost across all businesses right now uh, and not charging any individual business. So it will not, so your actual tax rate won't go up. Uh, but you know, if it gets, you know, extremely low, I know that this last year we did knock off 10% of the surcharge. Uh, there's, most likely we're going to have to put that 10% back next, next year uh, because um, we really needed our trust fund to be sitting at about three or three and a half billion to be what I'd call totally solvent due to the increased amount of people in the workforce. And right now we, before this started, we were only at right about 2.6 billion, uh, which right now at our current payout, which is changing on a daily basis, that gives us about uh, roughly about 79 weeks worth of benefits. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, one, one more question for you. And I know there's tons of others, but we'll just have to uh, help folks find these answers. I actually was reading about this earlier today on a couple of other national sites. What is the employer's responsibility if you've got an employee that is commission based? And so they're losing your question. You know, how, how does all that work? Well, what I would strongly suggest, if you have commission-based employees, and right now I'm assuming they're probably getting nothing, uh, go ahead and file a partial claim on their behalf so they can at least get something. Now, I'm assuming in this case that you do take out taxes and pay unemployment on that commission-based employee. Uh, they'll be in our system. Go ahead and do that so that way they can collect state unemployment from us, uh, also get 600 from the CARES Act, and if they end up being able to do some sales, you know, all you have to do is report when you do the, the partial claim process every single week as far as letting us know that they're still unemployed and if you are paying them anything at all, if say if they earn a little bit of commission, it'll be subtracted back out uh, from, from, from what they're gonna be getting from us. But uh, it would really help those individuals out if you go ahead and file for them because remember, your account is not gonna be charged, so it's not gonna harm your unemployment account. Okay, great. Well, listen, Commissioner, we, we appreciate so much what you've done and what your team is doing right now. We're, we're praying for all of you, and we know that you've got a lot of stuff to process here in the coming weeks, so we want you to get back to work to do that. Please know that whatever information you guys have, we'll be happy to put out, send it to you. We'll continue to facilitate questions. Um, I know many of you are texting me asking about the governor's shelter-in-place order. Uh, as soon as we get a copy of that, we'll put out guidance on our website like we've done for the local shelter-in-place ordinances around the state. So look for that over the next 24 hours. And then also I'm happy to tell you that um, based upon a lot of requests from our members, next Tuesday we will do one of these uh, uh, Zoom conference calls with Superintendent Richard Woods uh, to talk about the impact on education and K through 12 and what the rest of the year is gonna look like. So, um, and then obviously as things change at DOL, Commissioner, we'd love to have you back um, as things, uh, as you update things and we move forward. So. But, um, oh, and one last thing I'd like to tell everybody, if uh, I, I know some of you are having a hard time and you have some questions and you're trying to have a hard time getting through the phone system and uh, we're trying to get uh, some of that tamped down, uh, there is another way you can get in touch with us. Uh, it's, we have an employer hotline uh, and that goes under the employer section on our website under, under the traditional stuff. 
it has a phone number on there, but there's also an email address. I would strongly suggest you use the email address under the employer hotline uh, to send in, you know, you maybe your question and or your contact information where we can give you a call back. And it can take as much as 24 hours because I think uh, one of my employees that I've talked to this morning is saying that on one email box uh, that we have right now that's for general customers, we had over 25,000 emails in it from yesterday. So, uh, like I said, I know that it's very frustrating right now uh, because we do have a very heavy work, but this is very unprecedented. Um, but we're going to get through it and we're going to get caught up uh, here shortly. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you, Mark, for what you're doing. Uh, thank all of you for joining us today. Continue to reach out and follow us and we'll be back in touch. Thank you. All. God bless.